<clears throat> Welcome to 526 and I have to apologize for uh, the sound quality of the former videos. Uh, it was beyond what is perceivable. I will try to do a sort of repetition when I get into Carl Preben later on. But so far I will just sum it up a bit. And uh, what Baum goes through is that um, proprioception is something that we use to understand movement and that thought and movement goes hand in hand. It's not the ordinary model. The first you have uh, some sort of uh, analyzing and you come to a conclusion and then you decide to do something. Uh, I think that was already proven by John Libet to be completely untrue. David Bohm is saying rather than thinking perceive precedes movement, uh, that movement and thinking are implicit and explicit of something more fundamental, the hollow movement. And here we solve the problem. Uh, with the intention and movement uh, and I always been thinking uh, it's a cumbersome and vastly too complicated model we've been having about how we work and the usual model it's just incredible it goes a little bit like first we perceive things that is outside ourselves uh, it gets sucked up by the perception system, it gets somehow recorded and here you have memory as something separate from all the other things, like a memory base and that is obviously something taken from a computer or something similar. In this memory base things that you've seen are stored and uh, some sort of analyst puts those things together and you have a conclusion and that leads to action and the brain sends an intention to the movement system and you have a movement. It's way too cumbersome, it's just ridiculously complicated and uh, it's such an obvious imitation of the computer model, how the computer works today, I might say, it probably won't be working that way in the future. And there are always already indication that it was AI, uh, artificial intelligence, is going so fast this day, they are giving the idea of representation up altogether. Whereas we ordinary people, we stay in the old belief. There is a time delay, we are lagging behind. And David Bohm, he furthers the point and tried to show that civilization has done it even more difficult to see where the action goes, where the thinking goes. Uh, and because we don't have any sensory system to detect thinking, thinking and movement goes hayward. And all the problems we have today, instead of thinking maybe that was caused by what we do, and what we think, we tend to consider it to be something external, the problems like violence, war, pollution, disagreements, 
unhappiness, whatever, we see that as something external and that it needs to be treated external. But we should go one step further and see that thinking slash movement is where everything starts. And in order to understand that, you need to use the tool of tools of implicit and explicit unfolding and unfolding. Uh, David Bohm writes something like this in the article Proprioception of Thought. When the brain first evolved, it did not seem to have a built-in proprioception for the movements of thoughts and felts. If it is there is if it is there it's very weak weak and it's easily upset by any powerful emotion there's some sort of diversion like an emotion takes us directly from the perception the little perception we have we didn't need proprioception to detect thinking because in the early days human beings just didn't do a lot of thinking just a bare minimum perhaps in any case it wasn't so complex and powerful as it is today and this is of course the development of movement and thinking because we get more and more advanced tools we also develop thinking because those movement and thinking are the same thing. And there is a vast complexity level difference between being uh, an animal that doesn't use any tools to an animal that use tools that are immensely complicated. Like the Flintstone axe, it's very hard to make it even today. It takes years of practice. And when you get more skilled in doing something manually, your thinking process will change and get more advanced, more skilled, more acute and all those things. And this is obviously according to Barbara Tversky and also Tono Chimero and some other people. The reason that we have this advanced thinking today very different from what thinking used to be. Um, Barbara Tversky, she shows some tools where we use space to decontextualize uh, situations both in space, taking the subject out of the context, but also out of time, taking a subject out of a timeline or um, something happening. And of course, Johnson and Lakoff show that perception of space and room is used as tools to understand other things and usually the most abstract things are actually taken from how we handling how we are handling the world and how effectful we are in there um, Bohm writes further proprioception is an intrinsic potential that has never been fully realized we have to find out what is blocking it. Perhaps we can improve proprioception to some extent, but the primary thing is to release the potential. We really do have, have the potential, but it's being blocked by the mistake we fell into, which fills the brain. Human beings didn't notice what they were falling into as they built civilization. Little by little they go into it, but they didn't know what was happening. 
if you are like most human beings today, you do not realize that your actions follow from your intentions. I, E, I, if you assume they're from some other cause, then you're going to be very confused. You won't be able to survive if you attribute your own actions to something else, which is what is going on in society all the time. And saying it's something else is when we imagine that we have a conscious will and our thoughts somehow is under that control. Then we haven't realized that thinking and movement is the same thing. And we need to understand not the content of the thoughts. What we need to understand is the quality of the thoughts. And that is something completely different. And whereas we observe the content, it could be words, it could be meanings, those lack information, knowledge to give a good view of what that thinking is leading to. Thinking is quality, thinking is strength. Those are the qualities you should observe and need to observe to understand thinking. And strong thinking makes strong actions, decisive actions. Actions that lead to success. But thinking that, or trying to be aware of the content of the thoughts, that's um, a way that's gone astray somehow. It's not in the order of thinking slash movement. It's a quality, it's a direction, and actually it's closer to the whole movement, the unfolding and unfolding of reality that makes up the most substantial thing in both the universe and what we are. So what happens is that we send out intentions without thinking about it, without being aware. And we, when we see that those intentions do not give us the desired effect or the movement that comes out of intentions are completely wrong. This is what Alexander called misuse and that is what some uh, neuroscientists today call you are not in sync with reality. You probably live in some idea of your brain as a representational organ and memory being bits of reality that's stuck in the head or something similar to that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's more than vaguely ridiculous. Uh, I added in the previous episodes that it's a completely new idea that memory is somehow separated from cognition and intelligence. It always used to be the same thing and I'll say it still is to this day. Memory is not something stored in the head at some instant or point. Memory is the action you are doing. And Bohm does here make a comparison between thought without proprioception and a body without proprioception. And when you lack bodily proprioception, you could hurt yourself in a very decisive way if you try to move about. Actually, most probably you won't even be able to move about. But if we could use the muscular, mus muscular sense and try to develop a proprioception about thinking, then we could realize instead of sending off wrong intentions, 
we could stop the first thought uh, rather than fighting the second one, fighting it with the second one. And was what we must realize to some extent, without blaming, blaming ourselves, that the problems are in ourselves. We see them today as external problems, like stress is called, caused by too much work, uh, anxiety is caused by the modern society, ache. An aching shoulder is caused by working in front of the computer and so forth. Well, what we need to see is how thought makes up emotion and movement. And if we could see how thinking caused us to act in ridiculous and unpredictable ways, we would stop immediately. you wouldn't be doing it anymore. And this is a case I recognize from the Alexander Technique, but also other methods. If you're being told that your actions are absurd, uncoordinated, unbalanced or something, you will be trying to do something with it, correct it with another thought. But that will cause the problem to worsen rather than fixing it. It is therefore crucial to see it actually at its, as it is. Or the very best is to sense it proprioceptively and not just understand it superficially. And how is this done? Well, we can develop a proprioception that first triggers or sorry, not triggers, uh, checks and see small movements in your body. You need to make a sort of a correspondence how you move and how you think. And the more acute your action is, the clearer you will see that there is a connection between what sort of is inside, how acute your thinking is, how clear it is, and what you produce, maybe with a pen and paper. I think we tried that before, something recommended by some Alexander teachers. And in this process, you start to learn to see that thinking and movement changes all the time. And this is this enfoldment and unfoldment. And where you does when you start to do that, you are on the first step to do pre, uh, uh, a development of the proprioception, the first start. When you realize the movement you sense, the movement you feel and see is very close to the intention you give, then you make that conclusion that you can somehow, at least in some cases, or maybe just indirectly in the beginning, 
that you, you can be aware of your thinking. And this might sound, sound like you, you get an awareness of thinking second hand, but it's not that. What you start to sense is small micro movements you do, and you see that there is a change in how you think. And I think that's the first start to uh, develop a proprioception for thinking. But keep on, it's a little bit like keep your eye on the ball, keep your focus on the connection between action and thinking. And the more you do that, the more precise your movements are, the more precise you will see your thinking to be, the more exact your movements are, the more exact you will perceive your thinking to be. And if you're thinking is goal-directed, your actions will be goal-directed and there's a difference in strength in it. And all these terms are muscular and that is what we need to learn, that thinking is something very, very close in terms of muscular strength, direction, balance and all those dire directed, goal-oriented uh, and uh, then you start to find, oh, ah, I got that intention much stronger. Oh, there, I found a really clear intention. This is what you need to learn to do. And do not think that thinking is just representation. It's a little bit like Wittgenstein warns us, uh, do not get hypnotized or caught by an image that thinking is representational, representational, that they represent something in the outer world, but rather that thinking is closer to what we do with our muscles, what we do with our body, and uh, then you get closer to understand what it is. And even though it's similar, it's not exactly the same, but it is similar. It takes a uh, similar shape, similar properties. An example here you probably recognize from neurology or cognition science uh, and that is anger. You can think of anger as following. Anger, anger is actually a physical sensation. You get red in your face, you get an elevated pulse, you tense up and once you feel that proprioceptively you will realize that you are angry. And with this realization comes the real anger. You need to realize that you're angry too. It's not enough that your body is angry. And the real anger is a bunch of physical sensations. And why are you interpreting that as anger? Well, because you are traditionally conditioned to do that. All of society have, has always done that and you are doing it as well. But the moment you think what is happening to your system is anger, the sensation will also change. 
And that's a result of observation. What you could do instead is just to get into what your body is doing, what sensations it gives to you, instead of too early label it as anger. Because once you label it as anger, you are destined to take action on that anger. You see how, how uh, in enfoldment follows of uh, 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 enfoldment follows of enfoldment and that, there it goes. Something is being implicit and then it becomes explicit and then it becomes implicit again and so it go, goes. <clears throat> It unfolds and unfolds and just by observing it you will change the whole thing. This is akin to a rather well-known technique to get rid of headache which is to describe the headache experience very thoroughly and after a while it disappears. Something I tried for years and it does work. It does work marvelous. Or what you could do is to fully experience your bodily sensations to the fullest, to the utmost of your strength. a sort of going up into what the body feels. And when you do that, you, you're getting very much closer to proprioception of thinking, because it starts to, oddly enough, the whole thing starts with observing the movement. It doesn't start with, as you might think, trying to observe something in your head. But it is the movement, it's the felts, it's the sensations you are looking for. <clears throat> now you can also begin to either look at these things individually, but you can also try to do it when you are talking to other people, you are in a group situation. Uh, and when maybe you are in a quarrel with a person, you will notice after a while that you can keep the proprioception to a certain level and then you lose it again. But you can always in the end get back to it and the better you are, the quicker it will come back to you. It's like you have a heightened sense of anger or confusion or stress, and then you lose the proprioception for a while when the stress or the anger level gets too high, and on the slope, on the slope down, you will be able to uh, get the proprioception going again. It takes a while, but that period when the proprioception is completely gone will be shorter and shorter. And what you must remember here is you are really learning a completely new skill. It's almost something that is unheard of among the general population. Uh, we are not accustomed to uh, perceive thinking and looking at thinking. It's out of this world, I would say. And this is one of those things that interested David Bohm very much. And as you can see, here we have a physicist as David Bohm, taking an interest and transferring his knowledge, his mathematical knowledge of how the world is working. And he does so with tools that he invented for us to help us to understand. And by using these tools, we can sort of 
uh, sort of uh, become more quantum physical. But it, what it also means is that in all areas we can further our knowledge with these tools. They will always help you, help us, because they are in the end how the world works. There's no escape in that. Uh, and uh, it also makes it much clearer that the other worldview with representation is so absurd. And for every instant you feel the absurdity of classical physics and the representational idea is ridiculous. You, the stronger you step over into quantum physics. And I think that's very important because we need to learn both models of thinking and we need to learn the classical thinking as well even if we already have it and this is very similar to what Bohm is recommended when it comes to sort of observing your own bodily movement like in anger and that is we need to understand what is it that is so luring with classical physics that we still stay with it and one of the aspects is of course, it's an almost complete system. It covers everything in the world. It covers how do we have perceptions, how do we treat those perceptions in the head, usually, to make them into working actions, and how do we judge those actions afterwards. And this is obvious, just the model I uh, mentioned before, that we perceive the world and that world is outside our head somehow. Inside and outside are completely separated. And from there on goes the separation game. And for every time we do try to separate, the further we get from the point of success, the further we get from that reality that helps us to be successful. And the more we're coming into another worldview where we get confused, muddle up, and we start using model thinking, as Fredis Matthias Alexander said, unclear thinking and intentions that do not succeed because uh, the intentions are weak, they are muddled, and we usually trying to compensate one misfired intention, one weak intention with another one, and then we get this confused modern movement. And a worst case scenario that can show up as complete inability to uh, form uh, uh, actions, to form decisions. Uh, a person that is has a very big problem decide uh, is usually that sort of person and one of those most clearest indication that you have been through a high level of stress for a longer period stress that you probably exposed to yourself as much as you got it from the outside but those people often tell tales how they stre become stranded in front of problems that never caused them any second thinking even before and all of a sudden it becomes impossible to choose whether you should buy a banana or an apple and you just stand there in India and you just point something because you can't decide the body does it for you in the end that's very typical and uh, in that case is no use to ask whether it's the hen or the egg. Is it that uh, all our bad, uh, our bad intentions, which result in bad actions, is uh, the culprit for making the situation so bad that we get burned out? Or is it because that we just don't have any connection to our inner side? And when we don't have that for a long time, we tend to mistreat ourselves in different ways, and thereby putting us in the situation of, well, 
being even needed for medical treatment. I think I should run up here. Uh, this was an extreme, extreme, extraordinary long day. I went up at four o'clock and it's now half past 11 at night. So I think it's better to round off. But as they said in the military, if you're very, very tired and you tend to repeat things, it really sticks. Something we in Swedish call overtraining. And uh, I remember we did that again and again and we tried to be, well, the, the people in command saw to us that we were extremely tired, so it would stick even further. And this is a little bit the idea here with all those repetitions. And I will try when uh, we get further into the subject to transfer implicit, explicit, and folding, unfolding into different subjects. You're more than welcome to uh, recommend or suggest something yourselves, like literature or cooking or whatever that could be. Because every time you do that, you will see that you get different results, but you're still training the same process. So even if it looks different explicitly and the results are different explicitly, it will be the same process as quality wise, like a movement. And that could be good to remember that implicit explicit is usable in so many different areas, but of course give completely different results. Well, thank you very much and a good night.